But I want you to know that I'm excited. Though I'm nervous, I am excited um, just to have the opportunity to minister to you today, just to give you uh, what the Father has given me, what he has shared with me to share with you, because I feel like it's, I don't know, this whole, let me put my glasses on so I can see. This whole, um, this new place, you know, if you've been watching and you've been following along, you know, we just finished Adam to Adam, and now we're talking about living, you know, being lawless. And all of this teaching and all of this, all of these things, all of these new discoveries have just really caused me and caused me to see things differently, to see things in a way that is, uh, oh, man, beyond the norm. And if you're not, I'm going to say this, if you're not seeing things differently, if you're not seeing things beyond the norm, if you're reading uh, any scripture, if you're reading the word, if you're meditating in the word, and you are remaining the same, <sighs> something's not right. You need to dig deeper. I'm not saying you're not right. I'm just saying you need to dig deeper because Anything living changes all the time. Nothing really remains the same. Nothing seems the same. Even the Father, he always changes before us. He's never the same old stagnant God. So if he's never same, if he's never stagnant, then why should we feel that anything that we read or anything that we partake of him should remain exactly the same? Why should I read the word and expect the word to sound exactly like it sounded the last time I read it? If I am a more mature person, if I'm closer to the Father, and if I understand him more, then even when reading the same word, it should sound differently. Not that the meaning has changed, but the it's, I don't even want to say feeling because it's not an emotional thing. But the uh, application of the word changes. The application of the word changes, not the meaning, because he said, I never change. He's the same the day, yesterday, today, and forevermore. He said, I will never change. I will remain the same. But the application of what he said to me changes. It does not remain the same. It does not feel the same. It does not even sound the same, if I could say that. You know, there is a difference. And, um, and so I'm just excited today to have the opportunity to uh, share with you. And um, I believe one of my scriptures will be posted on the Bible app for you, which is Psalms 37 and 23. Another scripture I came up with later that was brought to my attention will not be so if you want to go ahead and turn your bible or your whatever app you're using to saint john's one in first saint john's verse 12 so have that handy when we get ready to go there we'll do that and uh again y'all i'm just whoo super nervous <laughs> but we're gonna do this we're gonna do this all right all right and so if you got your bibles and you've already turned to saint john's one and two for me um, that's where we're going to start. And I want to start there because, and I even wrote it on the board for you just in case you are not able to, for whatever reason, not able to pull it up. But I did write it. And it's a very familiar verse for us. But it says, but as, but as many as receive him, to them, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name key word power is what we're going to focus on a little bit but before we get into that i want you to say this with me say we are the lawmakers we are the legislation we are the judicial system to the to this earth we are lawless which supersedes the law not of the land, though. All right, so let's get that straight. We are, we are, we are the lawmakers. We are the legislation. We are the judicial system. To this earth, we are lawless. However, we are not so lawless that we are not disobedient to the laws of the land. Amen. If you was watching last week, you realize we got in trouble because 
we was going more than 45. <laughs> so don't drive over 45 when the sign says, okay? But yes, we are, we are expected to be the first partakers of whatever the laws of the land require of us. We are that example, both naturally and spiritually so. We can't be so spiritual minded that we just feel like we are above any law that has been set in the land. Therefore, to the world as they see us, the things that are natural see us, they will perceive us as just being what? Lawless in the wrong way. So, but we first are examples to the world through the fact that we are lawful, full of the law, that we understand the laws of the land, that we are obedient to the land. But the thing that causes us to be lawless, whoo, is the power. It is the power that has been given to everyone that has decided or that receives and believes that Jesus Christ is the son of God. That he lived, he died, he was buried, and he was resurrected. And he was given all authority and all power was in, is in his hand. See, that's so important that we understand that it was the life of Christ. It was the death of Christ in a burial, but it was also in the resurrection of Christ that makes salvation possible for us. At any one of those points, you take out any one of those things and then it's not complete. So he was complete in our salvation. He was complete in the fact that we were resurrected, right? Because of not just because he died, but it was because what? He lived. First, there was a life that he was an example to. That was he that he was, um, how you say it, submitted to the laws of the land. He rented unto Caesar what was Caesar's. He gave, he did, he was obedient. You never heard about Christ speeding <laughs> or jaywalking. <laughs> he could have been jaywalking. <laughs> you didn't hear about those things. He didn't get a ticket. He didn't get fined. You know what I'm saying? But yet he was controversial. At the same time, he was lawless. There was a spirit about him that caused him to be higher than the laws of the land. And most of the laws that he broke were not those of the land, but it was those that were supposedly spiritual. The religious laws, thank you. So when we talk about being lawless, we're not talking about being people who are ungoverned. But we are talking about being people who live above the religious law. Don't look at me and think that I'm religious because if you do, you're going to be disappointed. You're not going to be satisfied with who I am. And that's okay because you may not understand what it is to be lawless and to live above religious rule. All right? But if you stay, well, I'm going to teach you a little bit about it today. Hopefully, we get we uh you learn something after this is finished all right but he gave them power to do what and when we talk about power when we look power up in the hebrew term it is called whew, don't be laughing at me sydney exousia say that exousia that is a feminine noun why is it feminine because we don't have all power we only have a limited amount of power, but there was a power that's given to every man, every woman, every boy, every girl that will believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God and that he lived, he died, he was buried and he was resurrected for our sins. And so what does that power look like? So when you talk about the power, when you talk about we are legislation, we are lawmakers, we are of the judicial system, that if we're these things, then what does that power look like? Does it mean I could get out my car because I don't like to drive 45 and change the sign to 55 miles an hour? No, it don't look like that. If it says no parking, no parking. I can't say Archie parking only. You know, I can't change the signs because why? Those are the laws of the land. I can't disobey those. However, what the power, the exousia power that I've been given is the power and the authority to act both morally and spiritually. The power to act both morally and spiritually. So if there's anybody who's followed the law, it should be me. 
I'm the first. I'm the first partaker of the laws of the land. But at the same time, I'm going to be the first partaker to express my lawlessness, which is spiritual, which is beyond the um, religious law. And, what, and, and even when you talk about that, what does that feel like? What does that sound like? I mean, how do I, how does the world identify my lawlessness above the spiritual, I mean, above the religious regimen? I tell y'all, because I'm patient, because I'm loving, because I'm kind, because I'm long-suffering, you know, because I'm forgiving, you know, because I am... Um, I am all the things that the world is not. I don't seem religious. I, 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 when you expect me to react a certain way, when you expect me to do a certain thing, there's something about me that causes me to act in a way that gets your attention. When I'm living lawless above the religious law, there's something about me that causes me to be outstanding to you. Because all of a sudden, those things that you usually identify as natural things does not apply to me anymore. It does not apply to those who love God. It does not apply to those who walk according to the spirit and, 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 and not after the law and not after the world. So when you live a certain way, it should, how you say it, be illuminated. There should be an illumination about you. You don't have to go around with a t-shirt on. You don't have to go around with, with, with a, a, a cross on your neck. You don't have to, on all those things that symbolize that I'm a Christian. You ain't got to do it. You don't have to do it. Simply to me, that falls under that religious law. But my life, who I am, the things that I stand for, my conversation, the way that I talk, the way that I dress, the, just the way that I handle myself should cause me to be uh, amplified, illuminated in a sense that causes the regular world, the, the, the man that is of the natural to say, man, it's something about him. Man, it's something about her. It's something, why did he say it that way? Why did they react that way instead of this way? This is what I expected, but this is what I got. I don't understand that. But it's different. You know what? And, and even when I talk about that, it's not always um, it's not always weak either. We're not pushovers. You know what I'm saying? We don't just accept your mess simply because we're righteous. You know, there's a standard that we require. You know, even on how you address me, even on how you deal with me, even on how uh, the kind of relationship I'm in control of the kind of relationship you will have with me. That's what it, that's why. Why? How can I do that? How can I say that? Why? Because I'm the lawmaker. I'm the legislator. I said it right. I'm the legislator. I said my environment to be what I desire my environment to be. I set the laws and the rules and the regulations on whatever my relationship is going to be. I determine that. You have no control over me. I will not allow you to have control over me. You know, and that's one of the things I learned when I was becoming a son here, early, very beginning, you know, is don't give people authority over you. And sometimes we do that without even knowing how, and how does that happen? Well, when you allow somebody to push your buttons, when you allow somebody to get under your skin, ooh, I can't stand them. Person can't even walk in the room good. Oh, he didn't come. I got to go. I got to go. I can't stand them. You know, oh, I hope they don't say nothing to me. Ooh, if he say something to me today, I'm going O-F-F. -F. I'm going off. You know, I mean, and right there, you know, you think that you are in control of that situation, but you're not. That person said nothing to you. That person has done nothing. All they did was showed up. And immediately your mood changed. And immediately who you were changed. Your whole demeanor changed because of their presence. When that happens, that person has rule over you. 
So I refuse to allow anyone or anything to have rule over me. I refuse to allow any person just because of their presence to take dominion or to change my demeanor. You can't have that over me. I won't allow that to be so. And it's a mind process. It's a thought. It's, it's, mm, it's a choice that we make. Why? You can't you can't be a good law. You can't be a good lawmaker. You can't be a good legislator. You can't be a part of the judicial system if every little whim changes the way you think or the way you react. I wouldn't want to live under your law because it may be okay to drive 45 today, but somebody may make you mad. They were driving too slow, and tomorrow is 55. And then you turn around and, oh, he's driving too fast. I don't like the way he drives. They need to slow down. It may be 30 the next week. Why? Because somebody is getting on your nerves. Somebody did something you didn't like, and you allowed them to change who you are. Don't do it. Don't be that person. You have to be in control of who you are. All right? Righteousness gives us the right to exist as the lawmakers. It gives us the right to exist as those things. We are because we are what? We are righteous. And I love this uh, uh, beautiful thing here. And I'm going to read some things. And if you're not a part of, if you haven't been a part of our morning intercession, you may not recognize this. But if you are a frequent comer, comer, you will recognize this. But it is a very beautiful thing. And I love the way, shout out to my sister Jenny, the way she has, uh, yeah, the way she has broke this down and just talking about righteousness. She showed us how, how righteousness exists as an adjective. And, and I'm going to try to say these. And I, and I even wrote the, uh, the phonetic spelling so I can see exactly how to say it. <laughs> but Sadiq, Sadiq is the righteous possibility, judicial, just, um, just right in one's case. In other words, Sadiq is just being right. You in an argument, best example I could come up with. <laughs> you in an argument, you in a person arguing. And you look at my shirt and you say, you arguing the fact that his shirt is blue with white spots. Somebody else may be saying his shirt is white with blue spots. Um, because it's my shirt, I'm going to say it's mostly blue with white spots, with white specks. And so the person who's arguing that it's blue with white specks would be right because they they the facts somewhat back them up in other words it's what they do so that is sardik but then there's sardak which is a verb to have just cause to be in the right you know and even when you apply that uh when you think about that even when you apply that naturally so um you have to be careful with that even you know because that can get you in trouble I remember uh, I used to work with a gentleman, and me and him was doing something, and we was driving together, and uh, I had the right of way. I was driving him, and I had the right of way, and but I saw he we saw um, the oncoming traffic was not going to make the proper stop, and so you know he he motioned to me, oh stop Archie, go ahead and stop, 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 and I did. I slowed down and I allowed the car. To, uh, I don't know if it crossed us. I think it crossed us or merged into the traffic with us. And, uh, and I was frustrated. I was like, man, what kind of driving is this dude doing? You know, I had the right of way. I could have kept going right. I had the right. According to the laws of the land, I had the right to move forward. But then he said to me, he said, yeah, Archie, but you don't never want to be dead, right? <laughs> I said, <laughs> I said, that's a very good example. As mad as I was, I had to laugh it off. I was like, man, that is a very good example. But in the Father, when we are righteous, when we are righteous, we have the right. The right is given to me, and the right that we have when we are righteous is perfect in every way. It causes everything to flow as it should. All right. 
And so righteousness, which I love, which is the next one, which is, uh, how does she put it? Sadek. Sadek. I hope I said it right. Just, righteous, righteousness, character of the man. So because we are righteous, we are righteousness. We are not just righteous, but we are righteousness. Righteousness is our character. It's who we are. It's my nature. I, you know, I love it because when I think about even who Adam was and even Christ, the second Adam, when I think about um, or Adam in his original form and Christ, the second Adam in his form, they were the epitome of, of being Yahweh's nature. Their rule, their reign, everything that they were was, was because and existed because they were, they were of his nature. They had his nature. Adam's dominion was because of God's, Yahweh's nature. It was his nature. So when, when he gave man, and, and when he gave man the, the, the ability to reign and to rule and to have dominion over this earth, there was no law for him. He was lawless. But he was lawless because, because of righteousness. And because he was righteousness, he could exist as all these things. Who we are when we are righteous. And when, when we are righteous, that means we are full of the Father's nature. Our thoughts are his thoughts. Our likeness of things that we desire is what he desires and what he desires for us. Actually, if you abide in me and I abide in you, ask what you will and it shall be given unto you. Why? Simply because my desires are his desires. My nature is his, desire, is his nature. There's nothing different from him than me. So anything I ask won't be outside of his will. Why? Because I'm righteous. Because that's my nature. That's what I have become. So even as um, Adam was placed on this earth, he was given rule. He was given reign. Guess what he did? Everywhere he went, legislator, le legislation, lawmaking, you know, the judicial system, all those things went with him. Because of our righteousness and because of our likeness and because of who we are, guess what? All those things move with us. When I was a young man, they used to move me. Before I matured in God, they moved me. They taught me until I did what? Until I learned. And as I learned, I gained what? Righteousness. And as I learned and as I was moved by legislation, when I was corrected, when things, when I was disciplined and then when I was shown a better way, when I was taught how to walk, when I was taught what to say, when to say, and, 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 and just when I was taught how to look like the father. How to recognize his will. I started maturing. I started becoming perfect in him. And when I became perfect, as I become more mature, become more perfect in him, guess what? I look more like him because I become more like this. And pretty soon I look so much like this that I start to look, operate in this. These things no longer move me, but guess what? They move with me. The places I go, the things that I do, all of a sudden now I am directing what the law is. I am saying what legislation is. I am, I am the judicial system. Why when I begin to live above the law? When I become lawless, when I become above that religious, see religious law already tells me what I'm going to do. I... I, you know, I hate referring to it sometimes, but growing up, I remember whenever there was a big program that was going on. It didn't matter if it was a big program. It didn't matter if it was a small program. All right. Uh, one of the things that made it seem proper was to have a written program. Now, to me, as a kid, a young man, I thought it was probably the most redundant thing ever. Simply because you already knew what was on the program. 
you might not have known who was going to read the scripture. You might not have known who was going to say the prayer. You might not have known who was going to do the solo. But you knew <laughs> those things was going to happen for you in those order. After the first solo, then you were going to take up an offering. You already knew. You already knew what to expect. So that religious law was already in place. There was no change to it. There was no variety to it. There was nothing that allowed you to expect something more. You just hoped the person that was praying was alone with it and the person that was singing could actually sing. <laughs> but that was religious law. But when I become lawless, when I become above the religious law, Guess what? I don't have to wait on you to tell me to sing. I don't have to wait on you to tell me to worship. I don't have to wait on you to read the scripture. I don't have to wait on you to why I I just flow in it. It's all in me. Everything I am, I get to direct. I get to do, I just get to move and be at ease and be at peace like I want to, like I need to, like I know which is pleasing to him. I didn't write it down, but the second part of this verse says and he delights in him. The man or the person, the son that chooses, you know, to receive him and to believe in him. So much that he has given him power what, to, to, to be sons. In other words, to be, he has given him power to become a son of God. What does that mean? In other words, he, given, he has given me power to receive his nature. Righteousness. He has given me power to be a son of God. In other words, to receive his righteousness. Come on, somebody. And when because I am righteous, because I receive his nature, I am righteous and I am this. I am beyond the things that are religious. I am beyond the things that are locked in. Come on, somebody. Who I am, man, I don't, in other words, I just don't have to accept anything. You know what I'm saying? I don't have to accept anything. I don't have to be what you want me to be. But I'm going to be what the Father has called me to be. You don't know my name. He has given me a new name. You don't know the name that he's called me by. But if you hang around me long enough, if you keep watching me, you're going to figure it out. You're going to know soon, find out who I am. All right, come on, y'all. I'm going to flip the board right quick. All right, let's see. Y'all know um, my family and staff here has tried to erase my board <laughs> several times. <laughs> I came in early. I probably spent 45 minutes, believe it or not, writing this little bit of stuff, making sure I had the good stuff on there. And I had it over there, and the first thing my daughter was talking about, I'm glad I heard her conversation. She said, Dad, you want me to race that for you? I said, like, no. I just wrote that. <laughs> all right, all right. But Psalm 37 to 23 should be a part of your Bible app if you're following along. And I'm so excited about this because when Steve was uh, teaching us and in, 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 in expounding on lawlessness last week, you know, this scripture came to mind. And I thought, and even, um, even when I was talking about how, how the, the, the laws and the legislature, they, are, they follow you. I thought, man, how does that fall into this scripture because I know when we read this now this is what I was talking about earlier that if you're reading if your scripture if the if the application of the word never changes for you you need to go deeper there's something more in it so when you read this scripture uh, when you read that application it talks about that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And so automatically, at my first reading, I'm just, I'm stumped there. I, I, I'm like, okay, 
it causes me to be, um, it takes away my responsibility. It takes away my responsibility to be righteous. If you really, if you read it and you just leave it there, it takes away your responsibility to be a righteous man. It takes away your responsibility to be a lawmaker, to be of the legislature, to be of all the judicial systems and those things. Why? Because if my steps are ordered by the Lord, then all I got to do is exist. Thank him when he blesses me. Thank him when he don't bless me. You know, just if he say no, just accept that. It won his will. Whatever your will is, God's will. I remember that used to be a big thing that people would say all the time. Oh, I see you tomorrow, God's will. Well, what's going to happen? <laughs> oh, yeah, child, I'll be there, God's will. Come on. And even as a kid, I did not accept that. I always wondered, what is God going to do? What, what, what's going to change between you expecting to die? You know, maybe, you know, maybe God's will is for us to die tomorrow. He'll, you know, it was all about that rapture thing, and that's a whole other thing. Some people still living in God's will. Uh-oh. Can't believe I said that. Watch out. But the righteous man, we already talked about that man. We are already expounded on that man. We talked about that man that has the nature, the very nature of God. All right? That's that man where all the lawmakers and all those things walk with him. And they move according to his movement. Why? Because he's matured in the Father. But here's something I thought was so interesting. And I said, man, how am I going to do this? How, what is that supposed to mean to me? But the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And so I said, well, you gave it to me, so there's got to be more to it. I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to stop at the very uh, first side of it and die or become stagnant, or I'm going to dig deeper into it. And I did. Okay, here we go with some more Hebrew, Hebrew words. And thank God they were short and sweet and easy. <laughs> but the first one, we already talked about the rich man. Now let's talk about the word ordered. Now, if you stop there, it seems like everything's already set in stone for me. What does that mean? There ain't nothing else to think about. That's the conversation's over, but it's not. When you understand what order means, or order means, in Hebrew, the word is door. D O R, door. And, it's so, and this is so good, y'all. It's going to seem like to take you way out, but it's going to bring you back in. And door translates into generations. And the first time I read that, I was like, uh oh. I don't know what I got myself into. But door translates into generations, which is divine, similar but significantly different than our current understanding of today. Okay? Now, we immediately, when I think generation, we think of it in this linear, linear sense. From birth to birth, a beginning and an end as a timeline. That's how we think of generation. Well, my son is a generation. His son is a generation. And it seems like the generation stopped. But when you look at the truth of the matter, I never stopped living because another generation came along. And he didn't stop living because his, there was a generation behind him. So in other words, this door, which means generation, defines as, is defined as a circle with no beginning and no end. In other words, when I used to read this scripture, it, I used to interpret it as taking all the responsibility away from me to be a righteous man. Father, it was up to you and the Holy Ghost to make me a righteous man. It's all on you, Lord. You're going to hide all my faults. You're going to hide all my all these things. You're going to cause me to be righteous. It's your blood that covers me. Come on, somebody, but listen. That's not true. Uh-oh. 
That's not the story. That's, it was the blood that washed you, that cleansed you, that caused you to be justified, that caused you to be righteous, that caused you to be sanctified. But when I am a justified, sanctified, righteous man, the responsibility to remain righteous becomes mine. I cannot rely on the Father to order my steps and expect to be righteous. Woo, come on, somebody. You got to hear what I'm saying to you right now. All right. So door means generations. Okay. And it's not the Western interpretation from one birth to the next birth. This generation starts because there was a, bir a birthing, but then it ends because there's another generation that's come. That's not true. But this is the order, the generation. This is what door generation looks like when we truly understand the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord this is what it is yes I exist but guess what my son exists too and my son's sons exist as well that was not an end and guess what my father exists so what is the end just because my grandfather died, does that mean that's the end of a generation? No. It's the continuation. It lives. It exists. Why? Because there's another generation behind me. Now the responsibility of the righteous man come in now. Because not only does this mean uh, um, order, I mean, yeah, it means order. There's an order that needs to be set by a righteous man. Ooh, I love this. I love this. I ran out of board. I would have wrote some more stuff on it, but I ran out of board. But let me do this, y'all. Yeah. I hope you got this, because I'm going to erase a little bit here. Uh, yeah, it don't matter, because if I turn it over, you can't see it anyway. So I can erase this. Here we go. Here we go. All right, the next word now. Ooh, I love it. We got door, which is derived from the parent root, word dar, D-A-R, all right? And this is going to get real interesting. I like this because it's beautiful. Um, and dar, I got to do something for you. I got to draw some stuff for you. Okay. So we have door, D-O-R, which is order which also means generations. Circular. Okay? And now we have dar, D-A-R, which is the parent word of this one. Now, here's what happens. They, sh they didn't just give me a definition like they did for the other ones. They showed me something. They showed me a writing. And now remember, we're talking about, they showed me, showed me a drawing. Uh, remember, we're talking about the Hebrew language. So it's not right to left. It's from left to right. Okay? Also, and so this is what it showed me. <laughs> and I'm going to have to, I'm going to go ahead and make it look like a man's face somewhat. Okay? <laughs> Jay Leno with the big chin. <laughs> and this one. And so this is a phrase. Now this first phrase, this first picture, remember from left to right, this first one is actually a tent door. It represents a tent door. And this represents in, out, um, you know, backwards, forward, but all in all, movement. That's what the tent door represents. Now, just as it appears, this is the head of a man, and it represents a man. <laughs> that was simple enough, wasn't it? That represents a man. Now, Dar... And this expression means the in and out, the backward forward movement of man. Of man in what? In a generation. 
Okay? So all of it ties together. So you, the, the one cannot be separated from the other. So in other words, uh, uh, so it's the movement, the in and out movement of man in a generation. From one generation, how man moves in a generation and how the generation affects the man, move in the man. So there's not one that uh, is separated from the other. So what are you saying to me? In other words, my responsibility as a righteous man is to create an order that generations can move in. So if so as a righteous man, I am responsible for creating an order that my son can move in. My son has inherited that generation even though I still exist. Just because I have a son, it does not stop me from uh, creating the order. I'm still moving in the order. Why? Because there's no beginning, there's no end. I'm still a legislator. I'm still a lawmaker. I'm still part of that judicial system. Why? Because I am a righteous man. My job never ends and there's no beginning. And now my son becomes a lawmaker. My son becomes all those things. And here's what I see. Here's what I see. If this is me, okay, this is my son, and this is my son's sons, and this is my son's son's son, and so on, and so on, but because I'm a man and I don't know no better way, but there's no separation in the circles. Every circle is tied to the other circle. So maybe even a better way would be, this is me, this is my son, this is my son's son, this is my son's son, this will be my son's son. Every generation is tied to the next. The responsibility never leaves me. It never leaves you. There's an order that was given. There's an order the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Okay, somebody say, what about, okay then preacher, what about the Lord part? All right, here we go. Here we go. We'll do a little bit more erasing. All right. Because of this word, which is D-A-V-A-R, Devar. D A V A R. It is the parent word of both dar and door. This word means The spoken word of Yahweh. The va. But not just anything. But it, let me add this. It's the. And let me insert that. But it's the. Is it R A N G E D? Arrange. R A N G E D. Yeah. It is the carefully arranged. So we would insert that there. That's what my papers always looked like when I was in <laughs> English class. It is the carefully arranged spoken word of Yahweh. So. When he, so when he spoke to us, now remember, if we go to scripture, you can go to scripture on this because in the beginning was the word. The word was in the beginning. The word was with God and the word was God. So there is never a time that man existed that the word did not exist preceding him. Having preeminence in all things, right? 
So the word was always there. Not only did the word just haphazardly exist, exist, but it was carefully arranged. When he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, there was, that was, those words were spoken carefully. And the way it was arranged was done in detail. In our image, and in, oh, I love that. Did y'all not love that? The way that was broken down, the image being masculine and the likeness being feminine. Boy, I thought that was a bad thing right there. I love that. But let us make man in our image. See, this is a carefully spoken word. There was order that was already given. Even from the beginning of man's existence, order was there. Image, likeness. Uh, masculine, fem uh, feminine. It was there. Let's make them in our likeness. My likeness. My nature. Let us make man in my nature. My image. Nature. My likeness. My nature. Every part of me. And then it became, man, became a spoken word. And even though he did not say then, you know, a righteous man steps are ordered by the Lord. He didn't say it then. We read that in Psalms, but who knows? But he said it. He said it when he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. It was already, why? Because it was a spoken word. The Ten Commandments were not commandments, but they were a spoken word. They had an, a, they had an objective to get you to a place to cause you to become righteous. But I love what he did. He took the commandments. Christ came and he said, you know what? You could take all these laws. You could take all of them and hang them up on these two things. If you love the God, love the Lord God with all your heart and to love that neighbor as yourself, you could take all those laws and hang them up in that and you'll be okay. If you need something, if you need something to hold on to, you chew on that for a minute. But hopefully, as you chewing on that, it causes you to become this. And because you become this, you'll begin to understand and to implement this. The door, the order. And not only for yourself, but for the generations. And not only that, I love it, but I love this. This was really awesome to me. To be a man who has movement in and out of generations. I'm not stuck to my generation. Now, I may not be as cool... <laughs> and, uh -oh. I may not be as cool as my sons and daughters and, and uh, it was so funny and my wife oh, okay it was so funny uh, a few weeks ago when uh, Steve was talking about shade <laughs> that goes to show you man there's some things lost from one generation to the next you know what I mean and I understood. I see. I'm cool enough to understand that. I mean, the term should have been throwing shade. Why are you throwing shade on my game, man? Back off. You know what I'm saying? That kind of thing. But see, that sounded cool to me. But my kids are like, no, nah, pop, leave that alone. Now. <laughs> All right. Just because I know how to use the term, don't mean the term looks good on me. But in the father, in the righteousness of the father, having his nature. The generations can, can intertwine, can cross over, can be intermingled. You can't separate one generation from the next. So in the same way, you know, and, and, that, and that's a double-edged sword because many times as a more mature person, I don't always want to hear what the younger person's got to say to me. But because of that intertwining, that means... The wisdom that exists in me exists in them. You know what? You know what I love. I I, I kind of took a saying to make a saying, and I, maybe you probably use this saying too. I always hear young people say, "Man," or older people say, "If I had known then what I know now," and I say sometimes I use that when I'm when I'm get a chance to minister to younger people. I said, let me be your now and your then. Or let me be your then and your now. In other words, let me be the wisdom that you should have had 
And you never have to grow up regretting that you didn't know. And so if, if we become unselfish in that way, then guess what? That's what, that's what this is. That's the unselfishness. My grandchildren should never have to go through the things his grandfather went through. If I create the kind of generation and order that a righteous man is supposed to create. He should always, he should automatically have an advantage. He should know something more about the father at his age that I did not know. If I got to teach, if my son grows up, uh, let's say at the age of 18, and he don't know more than I knew when I was 18, I didn't do my job. I am so proud to say that my sons and my daughters are far beyond where I was when I was their age, especially in the things of the father. I have no regrets. I, I don't have to say, man, I missed it. I don't have to do that. I am so proud to know that my sons and my daughters are doing the things that are conducive to the order that was set by a righteous man. This is how... I define myself. This is how I know I'm, I'm a righteous man because of the generations. You will know whether or not you're a righteous man or woman. So by the generations, if you can look at your sons and daughters and you can be um, proud and you can know that, man, don't, don't be jealous. Don't hate. But love the fact that they're far beyond where you are. Love the fact that they're flowing in the Father in a way that you're not flowing in Him. Love the way that they do something and it calls you, Woo, what is that? Get with it. Don't hinder it. I've been there. I, I know what it's like to be hindered. I know what it's like to be here. Oh, that ain't God. How you know? Just because you haven't got there yet don't mean it's not the Father. Just because you haven't experienced it yet, don't mean it's not the Father. But if you would just allow the next general circle of generations to overlap over your generation, guess what? You will be enhanced. You will be blessed. You will be encouraged. You will become more. And you will understand that, dang, man, I am a righteous man because look at my sons. That's how you know. And um, I thank God for that and that's so much more and I, I've said all I needed to say about it because I wanted you to know that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord he spoke them. it's his spoken word but what did he speak to you he didn't tell Adam and I love this example I thought this was an awesome example he didn't tell Adam what to name the animals he just told Adam to name the animals Matter of fact, he just placed them in the midst. And he said, whatever you call them, that's what they'll be called. And he, didn't, he wasn't concerned about what Adam would call them because his nature was in Adam. It was done with a reason. It was done with a rhyme. You know, and that's one of the parts of science that I love. When they discover something, they don't just call it a, a, a thingamabob. Oh, yeah, that's the thing I'm about. We just discovered that last year, you know. But they call it an arthropod or, or, or in, in, they put it in a certain category. Why? Because it's done with the rhyme of reason. It's one of those things that is named. So even as a person, if you understand, now watch this. If you understand science and how they categorize something, you can almost not know the name of something and know the name of something. Really? If you came across, well, see, I, I'm going to mess this up. But a spider would be what? A spider's what? An arthropod? Or a ragnarok? A, a, a eight legged thing or something like that. But there's a category to how many legs an insect will have, right? So if I came across a spider and I never knew what a spider was, but if I saw it had eight legs, automatically I'm going to put it in a certain category. Oh, it can't be this because it has eight legs, so it must be closer to this. And how many parts of his body does, how many parts does that spider have? You know, that thing has, well, it has eight legs and it has uh, two sections. Or does it have three sections to his body? 
So that's another category. So it's not this, it's not that. But now I've eliminated what this possibly could be. And even though I don't know the name that was appointed to it, I could keep breaking it down scientifically and be able to identify this bug. I say, well, I don't know the name of the bug, but this bug is an orthropod because of the science. So I said that to say what? Even though I may not always know how to name or how to exactly um, identify this order. But because I am a righteous man and being righteous means that I am full of the father's nature. When I get here and I get to a place that I don't know exactly how to identify it because it's of the next generation. It is of a place that is beyond me. But because of my nature, I could break it down. And I could judge it. And when I see my sons and my daughters participating in something that is not like anything that I've participated in before, I can judge it. I can break it down. And I can see the nature in it. I can see his nature in it. And I can name it. And I can say, oh, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that move is, but that's of God. Teach me how to do that. You know, <laughs> so, and that's what I'm saying, people. And, I, and, and and that's what's just a blessing to me, and I wanted to share that with you. That the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. But that doesn't take away your responsibility. That means that you are more responsible, not only for yourself, but for the generations to come. Why? Because we are all overlapping one another. We are all responsible for each other. That makes my great-grandsons and my grandsons as responsible for me as I am for them. Because we're all together. The order, generations, man, it's all there. All right? And just the righteousness of who we are. Man, we are lawmakers. We are legislators. So it may not, it may not look like anything anybody's ever seen before, but guess what? The law legislation the judicial system moves with you so where you are look at it judge it see what nature it has and if it's of god name it if it's not of god cut it off and burn it up amen amen come on and bless him hallelujah amen so father i thank you for this day father i thank you for your said word your spoken word I thank you for everything that you've done. And we ask that you just be with those that were in this place, those that were with us online. I hope you I know that your spirit is just as active there as it is here. And I cause it to move within us. I cause it to change our mind. I, call, I, I, I speak and, and, and cause our responsibility level to be increased and never forgotten. But know that we are responsible for one another. In your son Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We are the roar of